Father, today as we come to your word, we recognize that we stand on the edge of things that we cannot know the fullness of. But we ask you to invite us into what we can know. We ask you to gently and kindly lead us more deeply into your love this morning. It's in Jesus' name, by whom we know that love, that we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I was listening to the radio a few weeks ago uh, to a report on the earthquakes that have been happening in Turkey and Syria. 53,000 people lost their lives that day. 53 that is a truly unfathomable number, but it's not the big numbers that get you. It's the stories of individuals, the stories of persons. That day on the radio, I heard a story about one baby who had been pulled from the wreckage of a high-rise with the rest of the family dead all around and the umbilical cord still attached to her mother. She had been giving birth the moment the earthquake hit, apparently. And only the baby had survived. That's unfathomable. That is completely beyond my ability to conceive. I heard that, and it was like I just got punched in the gut, like the wind got knocked out of me, just driving down the road. I almost had to pull over. Maybe you know moments like that. Maybe you've had moments where you were gutted, had the wind knocked out of you by just some words being spoken. Words being spoken of an unimaginable suffering that you couldn't have conceived of just a few moments before. Now, if there's someone to blame in situations like that. At least there's the consolation of an explanation. But what about those times when it's not anybody's fault? What about those times when there's no one to blame? When there's an accident or a diagnosis or a natural disaster, what insurance providers call those acts of God? What happens when there's no one to blame but God, when he's the only one left to ask, why? Why did this happen? Why does this keep happening? Why doesn't it stop happening? It's an absolutely natural question to ask and an absolutely difficult one for people who believe in a God who is all-powerful and all-good. Right, a God who cares for all and loves all and holds the universe in his hand and knows the end from the beginning and misses nothing. A God who is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. If that's who God is, then why? We're not, of course, the first to ask that of him. The question is everywhere in the Psalms, it's everywhere in the book of Job, everywhere in the wilderness wanderings, everywhere in the prophets. As long as there have been people who believed in a God like that, there have been questions like these. Including in Jesus' day. Including in passages like our passage today in John chapter 9. The context of John 9 is that Jesus has just given some some very brazen teaching at one of the Jewish festivals. He claims to have existed before Abraham, thousands of years earlier. He's basically making a claim to divinity, telling the crowds, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the religious leaders, of course, are, are, are absolutely apoplectic at this because it sounds like straight-up blasphemy or at the very least lunacy. So Jesus slips out of the temple area with his disciples only to come across the path of a blind man, a man they later learn has been blind from birth. 
The disjunction here is so strong because you have one claiming to be the I am who stumbles right into a tragedy. Because to be blind from birth in this culture meant tragedy. A lifetime of poverty and begging, never being able to care for yourself, never being able to to see colors, to provide for a family. So many roads cut off. Now, this situation doesn't necessarily have profound emotional resonance for the disciples. This man isn't any one of their relatives. It it doesn't even say he's crying out for help, but he's just another beggar, just another person asking them for money. It might be analogous to us driving past another homeless person on the interchange. But it's still a tragedy. And the disciples want to know why. Now, they knew, right, the biblical story. They knew the narrative that when Adam and Eve had sinned, creation was cursed, that thorns and thistles and death and hell itself entered the world. They they knew that spiritual, uh, evil spiritual forces were at play. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, evil spiritual forces were at play. They knew that that God's kingship had not yet been consummated over all creation. There was a battle that they were born into a broken world, and then in a broken world, sometimes things get broken, and those broken things hurt. They knew, as Paul would later say in Romans 8, that creation is groaning. This isn't the way it's meant to be. But those answers only go so far. In their day and in ours. Right? Why this man and not another man? Why this malady and, and, and not something else? Why hasn't God stepped in to solve this yet, even when he's healed all these other things? They want a reason for this thing, this situation. And in the Jewish culture of that day, it was common to recognize that link between the biblical narratives, between human sin and the general brokenness of the world, but then it was also common to take the next step and to overspecify it, to say that personal sufferings must originate in specific sins. You did something wrong, that must be the problem. Now, it's a convenient way to frame the question in a religious culture because it keeps us from having to ask the why question of God himself, right? Think Job's supposed comforters. Job just wants to get up in God's face. He wants to see him. He wants to talk it out. But they tell him again and again, if it's this bad, you must have done something wrong. Don't look at God. Look at yourself. And we still have that same tendency, right? We, we, we tend to, to sort of assume that those in poverty must be lazy or spend money foolishly, right? Somebody succumbs to addiction and we're like, ah, they probably, you know, made some bad choices along the way. We, 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 we look at those who, who do not carry their babies to term, who abort, and we say, well, you know, it's not that hard, just don't have sex, even though the realities are way more complicated. We all have those blaming instincts in us, but the Jews took those in this season to the next level. Because think about this, how could a personal sin have made a man be born blind? Well, some Jewish rabbis believe that the sins of a mother could affect the wholeness of the unborn baby. They even believe that a baby could itself sin in the womb. Now, I can honestly see that with twins. One of ours sat on the other in the womb the whole time, which was very rude. (laughs) But otherwise, I confess, I can't can't quite get my head around that. But, but, But they wanted, they needed an answer to why. Just as we want and need an answer to why. That need for why is what's behind the disciples' question in John 9, verse 2. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? But Jesus, then and now, rejects drawing this straight line between personal sin and personal suffering. Verse 3, neither this man or his parents sinned, said Jesus. He says, you got it all wrong. You can't draw that straight line. The brokenness of the world does not work that way. But then the why question falls back into God's lap. And church, there is no easy answer to it. 
Jesus does not give one here. Scripture really doesn't give one from beginning to end. Yes, we live in a broken world, but there's no easy answer to why it's broken in this way and not that one. Why God hasn't put everything back together yet the way it's meant to be. Why he allowed it to get broken in the first place. There's not a great answer. It's not for lack of trying. Right? There have been theologians who have said this world is the best possible world that could have been created and yet protected human freedom. It's possible, I guess. There have been those who have said that, that God, you know, actually He doesn't know the future, but He enters into the future with us as we enter into it. Now that would indeed protect God's goodness, but it undercuts His power and, and, and removes us from the Scriptures pretty far. Others try to say that God causes tragedy to turn us to Him or that He allows suffering so that we'll seek Him out or that, or that since He is all-powerful, all things must come from His hand, so we must think of them all as good gifts, as part of His plan, that, that everything happens for a reason. That protects His power, but it potentially undercuts His goodness. The truth is there is not a great answer to why. All the answers leave us pretty unsatisfied, which is enough to make us go looking for other answers. One of the most common is to leave behind this idea of the all-good, all-powerful God, either by running to atheism, right, where there is no God, or to something like pantheism, where God is not personal and everything is God. Right? You might have read something like the New Atheist pointing to the problem of suffering as evidence that God isn't real. You might have read uh, folks like Richard Rohr in his book, The Universal Christ, who make everything Christ and make Christ everything. They're both attempts to escape this unsatisfact, unsatisfying answer to why. But they actually create more problems than they solve. The problem is that if there is no God, or if everything is God, then you have a different problem when you face these tragedies. Tragedy as a category doesn't really exist. There's no reason to think suffering isn't the way it's supposed to be, because there is no way it's supposed to be. Everything just is. Suffering is just baked into the world as we know it, so, so there's really not a great reason to fight for justice, or weep over an earthquake, or mourn a diagnosis. Raging against tragedies becomes weakness and inability to live according to how the world actually works. That leaves behind one problem of suffering. Why do bad things happen with an all-good and all-powerful God and merely substitutes another? How can we honestly call anything suffering? How can we honestly call anything evil? Every worldview has a problem with this. Every person struggles to understand why things like this happen and why they hurt so bad. It's part of the human condition, and the why answers lie beyond our grasp, even for us, because at the moment, it's not ours to know. Right, as Job discovered, God is in heaven, and we are not. The counsels of the divine are not open to us or anyone else. So as Ecclesiastes said, was, as says, when we're answering these why questions, but our words be few. But what we do have in Christ is a reason why it hurts so bad. This is not the way the world is meant to be. What we do have in Christ is hope that there is one who sees the end from the beginning, who cares, who loves, who can bend the world toward his desire's ends, who is steering all things toward a redemption. And what we do have in Christ is an invitation. An invitation to move from asking why to asking how. It's not wrong to ask why, but it's not as fruitful. He, we're invited to ask, how is God working in this? Because the promise that we have is that He is working in it. John 9, verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
Do you see how Jesus turns their question around? Right? They want to know why this man is in this situation. But Jesus wants to know how God is going to work in the midst of it. Jesus points away from the why the darkness descended and towards how God will shine into it. See, asking that how question changes the whole trajectory of the conversation because it assumes, it presumes that God is present, that God is working for good, that God has descended into the darkness, into the tragedy, and that possibility still exists. It assumes that the tragedy is not the finished product, it's not the end of the story, it's a chapter in the middle of the story, even in death, the greatest tragedy we know, the story is not over yet. Now, what I'm saying is not, man, God makes everything happen, so everything that happens to us is good. I'm not saying everything happens for a reason. Please don't ever say that. Scripture never says it. That's not our hope. What I'm saying is that there are real tragedies. But there is no tragedy that God has deserted. There is no darkness so deep that his light is not shining into it. There is no brokenness that is beyond mending. The invitation to us is to ask how that healing might come and to watch for it. Now, that's a subtle shift, but it's a profound one. And you see it across the New Testament, another spot where it comes up. Think about Romans 8.28, really famous verse. It's often been translated, I memorized it, as all things work together for good for those who love God. That reading would make it seem like everything has to be received from the hand of God as goodness, as as a valuable thing in and of itself. But friends, some things are merely tragedies. Some things are are simply terrible. They are not good by any definition. But however they happen, wherever they happen, they are not a sign that God has deserted us. It turns out that all things work together for the good is actually a false, inaccurate translation. Romans 8.28 actually says that God works together all things for the good. In other words, the things that happen may be terrible, they may be awful, they may be inexplicable, but God is present even there doing good, drawing the story forward into the possibility of redemption. What the New Testament is saying is there is no evil that cannot be wrestled back towards the good, no evil that won't be wrestled back towards the good for those who are called by God according to His purpose. That's the good news. Now, we don't know what good. We may not see it in the moment. We we, we may not know it. Even if it's happening in us, it may be hidden from us. You may have been crushed by a tragedy. You may be being crushed by a tragedy even now, and there's no possibility for redemption that you can see, no sense that goodness could emerge from it. But this is the promise. He's there, and He's working, and He's working healing. Now, it may be physical healing, it may be emotional healing. It may be relational healing. It may be the gift of presence. It may be an awareness of sin. It it may be an awareness of the fragility of life and the need to get our stuff in order. We don't know on the front end, but he is there and he is working. I know it doesn't always feel that way. Sometimes it simply feels like any talk about Jesus or God in the midst of tragedy is, is cruel. Because it can sometimes feel like it's coming in wave after wave after wave, and it's just not stopping. And it's tempting to think that Jesus is looking at your suffering and ignoring it, or, or, or maybe even spitting in your eye. And he might be spitting in your eye, but not for the reason you think. 
Because right after Jesus says this to his disciples, what does he do? He spits in the dirt and he makes a mud pie and he puts it on the man's eyes. Now, I did a lot of reading this week to figure out just what symbolic import that spit mud might have had in the first century, right? What were the rabbis saying? What were pagan cultures doing? What could this have possibly meant? And here's what I came up with as the most likely answer. Spit is gross. (laughs) It's nasty. You didn't need a seminary degree to figure that out. But Jesus takes the gross and the nasty, and the terrible, and the awful, all the things that are thrown at us that seek to destroy us. And friends, He can use those things to make us whole. He can use even the most vile things to bring healing, even death. Now, the thing that we are most afraid of, the worst thing that could happen to us, right, is, 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 is death. It now runs out into life. Mr. Rogers' mother used to tell him when he saw tragedies on the television that would, that would scare him to look for the helpers, to keep an eye out for those who are rushing in to aid, rushing in to help. I'm describing the same thing just as a spiritual discipline in the spiritual dimension. Keep watch for ways he might be working because he is. You don't have to do that, right? You can focus on the blindness. You can focus on the spit in the mud. You can keep your eyes trained there. You can spend your entire life asking why, believing that since you can't understand how he's working, he must not be working. But you'll miss it when the light of the world breaks into the darkness. You'll miss God in that darkness, in that spittle, even in that baby still yoked to her mother. He has descended into our tragedies all the way. And the greatest proof is not even in these passages where he he tries to explain it, not even in the words of Scripture. The proof is at the cross. I think the cross is actually the only satisfying answer to our suffering. Right? We want to know why an all-good, all-powerful God doesn't just end the suffering. The questions the Scripture places before us is why an all-good, all-powerful God would come into that suffering and bear it with us instead. Why He would enter tragedy Himself and allow Himself to be crushed by it. This is why when when I'm struggling with with the tragedies, the brokenness of the world, overwhelmed by one story or by 53,000 stories, in in my prayer, I, I, I don't necessarily look up to the heavenly throne or the heavenly court. I don't try to enter the heavenly throne room in, in my mind's eye. The same God resides there. When I pray in that way, those images tempt me to think that he is far away, that he doesn't care. Instead, in prayer, in my mind's eye, I go to the cross. I literally, in prayer, picture Christ hanging on the cross before me, the Son of God in human flesh, giving himself over to tragedy. And yeah, I still ask why. But over time, as I watch him there, I find him so often guiding me to how. How could good come out of this? How could good possibly emerge from this? Friends, if we keep asking, an answer will come. If we stay with him at his last breath, if we come with him to the tomb, if we keep vigil through that holy Sabbath, if we keep our eyes trained on Easter morning, an answer will come. We're not going to see it in its fullness until the other side of his death or our own, but an answer will come. 
Because what was true for the blind man was also true for Jesus. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. May we know that it's also true for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we stand on the edge of things we cannot know. And we peer into the abyss. And we see you there. With us, for us. Working something which we would not have chosen. But, but which is no less in the scope of your healing. Jesus, pour out on us by your Holy Spirit the gift of faith, the gift of hope. Keep us from despair. Keep us from seeing only by what we can see. Keep us from believing that just because something is too big for us, it is too big for you. Father, we know your character is the character of the Son. We know that you love us. Help us believe it. Amen. said before, if you need prayer, I invite you to please go to the prayer ministers, the corners of the room here at the front and at the back. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created. I'll run to the Father again.